All right, that said, our next speaker that we will have the privilege of hearing is Dr. Allison Palumbo. She is an assistant professor of radiology in the vascular and interventional radiology division at UT Southwestern. She received her medical de degree and completed residency training at the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Chicago. She then completed a fellowship in vascular interventional radiology at Loyola University Medical Center. The title of her presentation is Less Invasive and Less Costly Interventional Radiology. Hi, I just want to thank Dr. Brewington for asking me to speak today. I'm excited to be here talking to all of you. Um, I'm Allison Palumbo. I'm one of 10 interventional radiologists at UT Southwestern. We have a pretty amazing group of people, and a lot of my staff is actually here today, so shout out to you guys. You guys do an awesome job, and I couldn't do what I do without you, so thanks, and it's nice to have you here. <laughs> um, all right, so what do we do as interventional radiologists? A lot of people are very, um, when I go out into the world and say I'm an interventional radiologist, they have, they're not quite sure what I do all day. So we do minimally invasive image-guided procedures to diagnose and treat diseases anywhere in the body from head to toe. Um, we pride ourselves on delivering precise targeted treatments with less pain, faster recovery, a lower rate of complications, and positive patient outcomes. So what kind of procedures do we do? This is a short list of some of the procedures we perform. So <laughs> this is not even all of them. The moral of the story here is we do a lot of procedures. So you being a, mostly a primary care audience, what can we do for you? What, is a, what, are, what can we offer your patients in a primary care setting? This is a short list of procedures I kind of came up with that I think are relevant to your practice and the, and the type of patients you'll see in your um, setting. So we treat uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. We can treat venous insufficiency, DVTs, pelvic venous congestion and varicoceles. We provide biopsies and also venous access for patients. So I'm just gonna break down a couple of those for you today and hopefully give you some more information that will help you understand what we do and what we can offer your patients and take that into your practice and help describe these procedures to your patients and hopefully they can come and see us. The first one I'm gonna talk about is treating uterine fibroids. Fibroids are the most common pelvic tumor in reproductive age women. Uh, they're benign. They affect 20 to 25% of women in, of childbearing age, and they're symptomatic in 10 to 20% of women. And by the time women reach age 50, approximately 7 to 80% of women have fibroids, not necessarily symptomatic, but present. Symptoms of uterine fibroids, um, the most common include heavy or prolonged menstrual bleeding, pelvic pain, pressure, dyspareunia, uh, urinary frequency, infertility or miscarriage, and even hydronephrosis, that enlarged uterus can press on the ureters and even cause hydronephrosis for these patients. So uterine artery embolization is the treatment we provide for these patients. It's a minimally invasive alternative to hysterectomy and myomectomy, myomectomy to these surgical alternatives. Um, that Efficacy of the procedure is based on level one evidence, so it's been shown to be very efficacious, and OB-GYNs have concluded that uterine artery embolization is a safe and effective alternative to hysterectomy. Pre-procedure, your patients will come and see us in our IR clinic. We do have a clinic where we see patients five days a week. Um, if they haven't already pelvic MRI before they come and see us, we'll order one. We like to have the MRI for our pre-procedure planning. Um, occasionally there are collateral arteries that feed these fibroids, and if we know that before we go in, it can help our treatment planning. A lot of times ovarian arteries can hypertrophy and provide the, and uh, supply those fibroids. And then we'll also order any necessary pre-procedure labs. And of course, explain the procedure to the patient and answer any of their questions. So here is an MRI of the pelvis. Um, this is a, just for your education, a sagittal T2 weighted MRI, and we know it's T2 because fluid is bright, H2O, T2. Um, this is the uterus here, this is a normal uterus. So we have the fluid filled endometrial cavity here, the lower signal myometrium, and then the uh, more high signal endometrium here, and that's normal. This is a fibroid uterus. You can see it's remarkably different. It's a large, bulky uterus distorting the pelvic contents, compressing the bladder here, which is why a lot of uh, patients feel that urinary frequency. So what does the procedure entail? What can you tell your patients to expect um, when they come and see us? 
Our procedure is performed in the angiography suite, which are our operating rooms. We do the entire procedure through a small incision in the groin. It doesn't even require stitches. Um, we place an artery, a catheter into the right common femoral artery, and we can go into each individual uterine artery, selectively catheterize it with a microcatheter, and deliver very small particles to the uterine arteries. These particles are about five to 700 microns. They're very small. Um, they pack into those end arteries and cause ischemia of the uterine fibroids, which we hope most of the time alleviates patient symptoms. So here is a picture from one of our procedures. Just to orient you here, you can kind of faintly see here the femoroacetabular joint. This is the pelvis here. This is the other hip. So we have a catheter right here going in the iliac artery, coming up and over a microcatheter, selectively catheterizing the uterine artery. And this is a digital subtraction angiogram um, in the uterine artery, showing this very tortuous uterine artery and this big blush here in this fibroid uterus. So this is pre-treatment, and then we deliver those particles and do another angiogram, and this is post-treatment. And you can see the pruning of those vessels. This is a pretty good result here for this patient. Post-procedure, the patients will be required to lay flat for two to four hours, and that's to help achieve hemostasis in that arteriotomy we've made for our procedure. The patients will have a Foley catheter placed pre-procedure. They'll keep it in throughout the procedure and for the few hours afterwards when they can't ambulate just to help them. They aren't able to get up and urinate and nobody likes the bedpan. Um, they will stay overnight with us for pain management. We usually give them a dilated PCA. And more often than not, I'd say 99% of the time they go home the next morning. We transition them. We get them up and walking around, transition them to oral pain medications, and um, send them home the next morning. Most patients can expect improvement of their symptoms within two to three menstrual cycles. Um, and I always kind of stress that with them. Their first period after this still may be really heavy, and uh, you need to tell them to wait at least two to three menstrual cycles to see the full results. And it's remarkable. These patients are incredibly grateful. This is life-changing for these patients. I mean, they, their whole lives revolved around their periods at one point, and now we've completely changed their lives, and they're incredibly grateful. It's a really nice procedure. Um, so is uterine artery embolization more cost effective than hysterectomy? It's very efficacious, it's a good result, but is it practical, is it more cost effective? There was a paper published by the REST investigators. These, this group has published a lot of data on uterine artery embolization. Um, they collected data for up to 12 months after treatment, and it includes everything from hospital stay, follow-up appointments, treating any complications the patients may have, and analyzed the total cost of that versus hysterectomy. Um, 157 patients were included in this study, 106 underwent uterine artery embolization, and 51 underwent surgery. And the bottom line here is that uterine artery embolization was associated with lower cost compared with surgery. Um, the mean difference was about $1,700. So that's pretty good considering a lot of women receive this treatment. That's a big cost savings in the healthcare system and for the patients. Um, a second study here published in 2004 compared the cost effectiveness of uterine artery embolization versus hysterectomy. Um, not only was uterine artery embolization considered more effective as far as morbidity and mortality for these patients as compared with surgical hysterectomy, uh, it was less, expensi less expensive than hysterectomy for symptomatic uterine fibroids. And this um, analyzed it in an incremental cost effectiveness ratio per quality adjusted life year. A quality adjusted life year is one year of life in perfect health. So the cost savings there was about $2,000 per um, quality adjusted life year, also quite significant. So again, is uterine artery embolization more cost effective than hysterectomy? And the answer is a resounding yes. Not only does it have less morbidity and mortality, but it's associated um, with more cost savings. And the second um, condition I'm going to talk about is venous insufficiency, um, something else we can treat for your patients. This. Um, Animation here is just showing in normal veins, the, your veins take your blood from your extremities back to your heart. Veins should kind of flow against gravity back up towards your heart. You have these valves in your veins, and when that blood tries to flow backwards, the leaflets oppose each other and prevent backflow of blood. In a lot of patients, these valves become incompetent, and blood is allowed to flow backwards, and in a lot of patients, into their legs. And um, they experience leg swelling and oftentimes varicose veins. Varicose veins affects 25 million Americans. Your patients are probably complaining to you about heavy, tired legs. Um, it gets worse after standing all day. Their legs are achy and painful, a lot of times swollen. Um, they'll get skin discolorations and eventually venous stasis ulcers. It's a good thing I'm going after lunch. Sorry about the gross picture. Um, venous stasis ulcers 
most commonly occur at the medial malleolus. And here you can see the very typical changes that come along with it, this skin discoloration from lipodermatosclerosis, which is a paniculitis of the fat and the subcutaneous soft tissues. You get that skin thickening, um, and these ulcers, they have a very difficult time healing. I just treated a patient last week. She's been trying to heal her ulcer for 20 years. So I'm gonna see her back in clinic, and hopefully it'll be healing. Um, here's a little animation of that dilated varicose vein draining into the deep venous system and that overlying ulcer. Um, we can offer patients vein ablation, um, and that procedure entails them coming into our angiography suite. We'll identify the abnormal vein with ultrasound. We can access it with a needle and place a wire through that needle and over that wire place a probe. We treat these veins with either um, laser, laser ablation or radiofrequency ablation. We can use either probe. And then um, that probe gets advanced all the way up to the saphenofemoral junction in their inguinal crease. We're usually treating the greater saphenous vein. And we just pull that probe back and incrementally ablate as we pull back. It immediately um, scleroses down that vein, closes it off nicely. And with time, that segment becomes atretic. The deep venous system takes over for the blood return, and it usually resolves their symptoms. About 90 to 95% of the time, people have a two-year success rate. At two years, there's a 90 to 95% success rate for this treatment. So again, they'll come see us for a pre-procedure visit in our clinic. Uh, if it hasn't been ordered already, they should have an ultrasound. Usually this happens before they come and see us. The ultrasound is a venous reflux ultrasound that demonstrates the incompetent veins. Um, our procedure is done same day as an outpatient procedure. The patient will go home with their leg wrapped from hip to foot in an ACE bandage and a compression stocking over that. Um, in two days, they can take off that ACE bandage and compression stocking and then place just the compression stocking on, which they need to wear for 30 days. It's incredibly important that they know about this and they're compliant with this part. This is what's going to make their procedure successful. If they don't keep pressure on that treated vein, there's a potential for it to open back up. Um, They'll come to get a follow-up ultrasound for DVT in one week. Um, it's not very common, but this procedure does put patients at risk for DVT, so we just evaluate for that in one week. So it's a great procedure, it's easy for the patient, but is it cost effective? Well, first of all, just backing up, taking a look at how much um, venous insufficiency costs our healthcare system. Patient with, patients with active venous ulcers are estimated to cost the healthcare system up to $10,500 annually per patient. Uh, management of venous stasis ulcers may constitute as much as 1% of total healthcare costs, and that's pretty significant. So it's very clear that um, venous stasis and venous insufficiency um, creates a large cost burden on our healthcare system. So what is the best treatment for these patients? They can come see us for ablation or they can see surgeons for vein stripping. Which one's more cost effective? Uh, there was a paper published, interestingly enough, by vascular surgeons in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. Uh, it was a one-year retrospective analysis of our catheter vein ab ablation versus surgical vein stripping. Um, and vein stripping was associated with a higher cost than our catheter ablations. And that was mostly attributed to the higher cost of taking patients into an operating room. Here's kind of the take home point from this paper. If you take a look at this chart here, this is the radiofrequency ablation and the endovenous laser ablation um, here, and these are the surgical procedures. So these are a little more expensive, but it's, it's not quite the remarkable difference that we saw with uterine artery embolization. So again, is EVLT cost effective? And the answer is yes. Not as huge of a resounding yes as it was with uterine artery embolization, but coupled with the fact that it has um, an improved morbidity and mortality in comparison with um, surgical vein stripping, and it is shown to be more cost effective, it's definitely, in my opinion, the treatment of choice for most patients. So just to wrap up here, we do have an interventional radiology clinic at UT Southwestern and also at Parkland. It's staffed five days a week by an MD. One of us is there five days a week. We do pre and post procedure evaluations and we'll do any consultation that you'd like for us if you have some patients you'd like us to see. Our number is there, you can call and schedule appointments. Or if any time you even just have a question, is there anything available to your patient that, that we can offer them or you have any questions you wanna ask us, feel free to call that number anytime and just ask to speak with one of us and we'll be happy to talk to you and answer any questions you may have. And that's it, thank you so much.